Um, like I said, there's forms up here and stickers. You don't have to fill out a form to complete a sticker or to get a sticker, but it'd be nice. Um, so thanks for joining me after lunch. Uh, usually I'm stuck before lunch, so everybody's trying to run out of the session. Um, but now it's just up to me to keep you awake after lunch. Um, so a little introduction. I'm Rick Kosowski, uh, Technical Product Manager from IBM. Uh, talk here today is going to be on uh, containers, uh, specifically on Docker. Um, I generally like to start with a few questions. Um, since we have a room of a decent size, and just based on some of the talks I've attended so far, there tends to be a good kind of variance of experience, knowledge, or just kind of uh, question. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, no problem. Of uh, just uh, just overall exposure to some of the talks and topics. So um, just go through some of these to get a good feel for who's in the room. Um, where we'll go, kind of the depth we'll spend at certain points of the presentation. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions, actual questions at the end. Um, and also I'm wearing more mics than I ever have, so hopefully I don't trip and kill myself. Um, so first, uh, who in the room classifies himself as a developer? Good, a good bit of the people. Uh, who would be a developer manager or a manager of a development team? Okay, that's good. Um, who would consider themselves an ops person? Based on the amount of developers, that's more than I expected, but good. Um, so who works for a startup? Who would consider themselves an enterprise developer or a corporate developer as per the uh, Hydra buttons in the bags? Okay, that's a pretty 50-50 split, so that's, that's not bad. Um, who here has ever heard of Docker before? I know you guys have. Okay, so that's a good portion of the room, so I'm glad. Uh, who's using Docker now? That's why I asked the question, because a lot of people have heard of it, but then you can see hands where not as many people are actually using it. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of tend to, to talk a little bit more about the, the front of it. Um, anybody here is in DockerCon in Barcelona? Okay, so a few. That's good. Um, so we were there last week. We had a pretty big IBM presence. We were responsive there as well. Um, the majority of the presentation isn't going to touch on anything IBM, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but jumping in, uh, let's start off by talking what is a container. Um, I mean, just based on the number of people in the room who have heard of Docker, but then the drop off as far as who's actually using Docker or playing with it. Um, I mean, this is a good section to kind of talk about what it is, what it isn't, and why you want to use it. Um, and then we'll get into kind of the benefits of Docker as well as uh, kind of the next steps, where we're going. Um, and kind of very similar to some of the microservices talks that have gone on so far, how Docker fits into those overall, or containers slash Docker uh, fits into those overall architectures. Um, so starting off, I mean, Docker is one of the more popular container technologies. Um, it's not the only container technology, so there are other technologies. Um, Docker at the moment is just the one that's easiest to use, uh, has the... I'd argue the biggest marketing budget, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they have a corporation behind them, things like that. So um, that's generally what we'll be talking about as far as containers, the same as Docker. Um, but you know, technically, they're not exactly the same thing. Uh, but who, one other question that we could have thrown up on the slide for questions, um, who has under five years as a developer experience? Uh, who has more than five years? More than 10 years? Awesome, good. Um, so for most of the people in the five to 10 plus range, depending on where you're working, maybe even the less than five year range, um, you kind of know this type of pain where you have all the things that you need to deliver across all the things that you need to deliver on. Um, and so across my career, I've been a developer, a QA person, a tech sales person. Um, so it's been a little bit of all over the place and knowing this, uh, I've had, a Peers deem this slide the matrix of pain um, to kind of make sure you have coverage of all of this stuff across all of this stuff. Um, and so I don't know how many times I've started writing something or working with something or peers where you start, you know, working with a development VM or a laptop and then it's working, but now the pain of actually figuring out how to get it across one of these other pieces while moving over all of these separate kind of components that you need in your infrastructure is, is quite painful. So that's really where 
some of the Docker pieces came in um, where this really isn't similar to things that you see in the real world. Um, starting you know, back in the 1800s with interchangeable parts, it really made sense to not have custom parts for everything. If you have a lot of the same things, everybody knows how to interact with them. If you have a lot of the same pieces that they can plug into, something breaks, it's a lot easier to fix. You don't have to carve a new gear out of, you know, from scratch, you can just go to the store and buy one. So similar to that with the shipping container analogy, analogy um, since we'll be going heavy on the container analogies today, um, you have the combination of all the goods you need to ship that are obviously very sh shapes and sizes, similar to all the packages that we were just looking at. And then you have all the things they need to interact with. People need to pack them, people need to load them on ships, people need to move them across oceans, people need to unpack them and then get them where they're going. So um, not unlike a lot of software you're developing, whether it's a small web app, whether it's a messaging application, whether it's a, uh, a backend mainframe database application. I mean, all this stuff needs to be written, needs to be tested, needs to be shipped, needs to be deployed in many different places, generally and even more frequently now um, with the advent of, of cloud and kind of ubiquitous infrastructure, um, those can, pieces can be globally distributed. Um, so if you're thinking about how you would do that on some of the platforms that I used to work on where there were WAR files that were literally four gigabytes, um, that was a pain. You, it would tear your eyes out trying to figure out how to, to get it in something like this. So, that's really where some of this comes in here for the container methodology of really defining your boundaries, defining your interfaces, certain people knowing what they can focus on outside of the container, certain people knowing what they can focus on inside of the container, and then really having a good idea of how to manage each and each instance. Um, separation of roles, separation of concerns, and then really a separation of kind of who's touching what parts of the container. So, you know, this is what the metaphor goes to now where we ended up having the idea of being able to package all of our applications in a running way. Um, there's a lot of language dependent package managers. Um, you've got NPM, you've got Ruby, um, you've got all your Linux based package managers, but then there you're still very much focused on and dependent to the technology you're running with um, where pretty much everybody has to know how to use NPM or some of that or um, how some of the Ruby uh, specs need to be run. Um, but with containers and, and Docker it, more specifically, all you really need to know is how to package the container, how to interact with the object you're given. Um, so it's more or less object oriented or inheritance based infrastructure. So that you can really just work with those pieces of, of uh, code that are shipped. You don't have to worry about how it's built. You don't have to worry about the, um, what it's running on, uh, depending on where you're running your containers, how it's monitored. Um, but we'll get into some more of that later on. So this is really what it ended up turning into, where now the, the key piece here is just the Docker container, where it's the same no matter what pieces you're running up here. Um, hopefully each of those pieces is a separate container, um, but we'll talk about that as well. Um, and then you have all the same pieces that you can run on all the different laptops, um, or sorry, all the different platforms, be it a laptop, be it a VM, be it a production system, be it public cloud, be it an on-premise cloud, wherever you want to run this stuff, it's the same thing that you built, and we'll, we'll touch on this in some of the other ones, but it's the same thing that you built on your laptop that you're running uh, in the cloud, that you're running in production, uh, and there's really no difference between how you handle that. You don't have to worry about somebody SSHing into a box and changing it, um, as generally you're not keeping up your containers uh, similar to VMs, uh, they're not, they generally don't tend to be as long running. They tend to be more short lived. Um, it's just something where it's a lot more stable, a lot more, you know, uh, easy to, to kind of build, ship and run, which is Docker's core motto. And we'll actually touch on that in a minute. So again, like I mentioned, it's a separation of concern. So Dan, the developer, he knows how to build the container. He shoves all his stuff inside it works on his laptop, he can build it, he can run it, he can do a Docker run, it fires up all the pieces that he needs to, um, and he can verify it's running locally, and then, okay, good, whether, uh, well, a caveat there, as with anything, you can build stuff that doesn't work and isn't portable. Um, anybody who's a JEE developer understands that. Um, 
so I mean, so there's definitely certain ways to build your containers, build them so that they are portable. But for the most part, this is pretty much universally true. Uh, it's his code, his libraries, his uh, parameterized dependencies, things like that inside the container. And then the ops guy, hence the reason for asking if there are ops people in the audience, um, just know about running, logging, remote access, monitoring, um, and just what to do given the container. So, you know, Dan is building it, Oscar's running it, certain teams are the same guy, um, but for the most part, you know, Oscar needs to, all he needs to know is how to start, stop, bring these up together, and later on in the, uh, the talk, we'll see how some of these start to grow, where now you can see like, oh, it's cool, I can run this instance of a web server, I can run this database, but that's only one container. How do you handle managing a thousand of them, um, since that's really gonna be what you need to manage a production-like load? Um, so we'll touch on that towards the end. So just kind of deep down for anybody who hasn't really been on containers or kind of worked with them, this is how they break down pseudo-technically. Um, inside of Linux, there isn't really a notion of a container specifically, and I'm sorry if I'm blocking everybody over here, I'll move over here for some too. Um, there really isn't the notion of a container as a concept. It's a collection of certain uh, kind of Linux fundamentals. You've got namespaces, you've got um, ch root, you've got a couple pieces that all come together, and hence Docker's the one that is really kind of put all together in the most easy to use fashion. Um, more or less one of the reasons why they're more popular, but the other container technologies are all based around similar concepts. So who here has heard as, or has heard containers as uh, lightweight VMs. Okay. So I mean, generally, that's the way. That's the way I was introduced to them. That's the way a lot of people I know were introduced to them. So, when you're looking at VMs, you generally have the file system, the base OS, the pieces on top of it, as well as all your libs, all your package managers. Every binary under the sun is in your VM. Um, when you need to clone that, you're cloning. 40 gigs if you're lucky, um, you know, it's less than that. If you like pain and you have link clones, then it's even less than that. Um, but it's still a good bit of well over five gigabytes for each of the VM copies. Whereas now, once you start talking about containers, containers are built as a collection of layers. Um, you can have a Fedora container that it, all it is is just the Fedora modules right on top of your base OS kernel and file system. If you want to install Tomcat, all it is is the Tomcat shard on top of your Fedora layer, and then when you install your app into Tomcat, it's just that. Whereas now, when you pull your app layer, that's gonna be 30, 40 meg, um, depending on before where to ship your app in a VM. You know, still, again, it was gonna be 10, 20, 30 gigabytes. Um, but now you have just a collection of some layers here where your Fedora layer may be 300 meg, your Tomcat layer is probably gonna be about 100, and then your app layer is hopefully at most 100 depending on dependencies. So then you're still looking here where you're still a great order of magnitude less uh, for uh, the size of your app, the size of your distributables, and the size of what you're moving through your pipelines as opposed to something that is, you know, can't fit on a DVD um, uh, while, you're, while you're moving it around. So any questions on kind of the technology of containers before we move on? Okay. So, the mission that Docker put out, and that's why we're kind of focusing on Docker more so than LXC or any of the other container technologies, is they really are the ones that nailed it as far as a consumability perspective. Um, being an enterprise developer, being a uh, technologist who works with larger companies and even our larger software, um, consumability is a large problem. People aren't gonna use your stuff if it doesn't work, if they don't understand it. Um, so the fact that Docker is so easy to run, it's so easy to build, um, and they figured out how to you know, move software uh, around pretty quickly on top of this container technology. Um, it's something that's really you know, lent themselves uh, a lot of speed and just a lot of uh, opportunity in the marketplace. So the three, the three phases we'll touch on are build, ship, and run. Uh, I mean, each of those applies to both the kind of the dev roles and the ops roles and some of the, the other questions that, that I led with up front. But, I mean, if you're not using Docker today, you can really run anything inside it. Um, the caveat being uh, it's built on top of Linux. So as of today, uh, it only supports 
Linux runtimes, Linux applications in the middle. Uh, Docker is partnering with Microsoft to get that up and running on Microsoft uh, Windows Server 2018. Um, it's, I believe, out in some uh, release candidates now, but it's nothing available quite yet. Um, so that's why you don't see any Windows icons up here except for technically Azure, but those will still be Linux VMs. Um, and then, like I said before, you can, you can run it anywhere. So back when we were talking about that, the matrix of pain, um, whether you're running an on-premise uh, OpenStack cloud, whether you're running it on a server under your desk, your laptop on your desk, or if you're sitting under your desk with your laptop, um, AWS, Bluemix, Azure, Google Compute, um, or even a VMware cloud, you can run this where the same code wherever you want as a collection of images. You don't have to touch the code. You don't have to change it. All you're doing is still interacting with Docker, doing a Docker run, spinning these things up, and then really being able to, to build it out as a uh, infrastructure as code. Um, just you know, like I said before, inheritance-based infrastructure, uh, object-oriented infrastructure, where you can really build on, extend, and move some of the stuff there. So the first step in that is build. Um, that's really kind of what we talked about so far as far as the construction of it. Um, and that's really all of it is based on uh, the, co the container technology, how it works, um, what it means to kind of build this stuff with the copy on write file systems, et cetera, et cetera. All the, the technical kind of gar garble under the covers. Um, now, as most of you aren't native English speakers, I'm not a native Spanish speaker. In a lot of the sessions so far, I've seen that memes were the best thing to kind of cross boundaries. So from here on out, we'll have a good bit of them. Um, just as, as kind of a caveat or a heads up there. Um, but being as there's a, a lot of developers in the room uh, who could relate to the story of once you've built it, you really didn't want to worry about how to get it somewhere else as far as moving it, shipping it, or delivering it. Okay, well, I find that hard to believe. Um, but I mean, this is really what build ends up doing for the, the Docker mainframe and kind of uh, containers. You can build it, you can move it, you can ship it, you can deploy it with, with a high level of confidence. Um, you're not sweating every time you move your code through the pipeline. Um, you're generally not worrying about what's breaking. You're generally not worrying about, do I have to babysit it? Um, I don't know how many installs I've done of enterprise level products that, you know, they were three, four hour installs. And now you're thinking that's, who's ever going to do that? But there's a good number of products that I've installed that had that. and. They failed it two hours and 58 minutes into it, and so you have to go back and you know retry it, retest it, do all that stuff. Um, the kind of the build component of uh, of Docker really highly ensures that wherever you move this to, wherever you push it, wherever you run it, um, it is going to be something that you don't have to sweat, you don't have to babysit, um, and it really kind of uh, increases the the adoption of it since it is something that is runnable. And so the second step is ship. Um, there's a good bit of stuff as far as talks on DevOps, talks on CI and CD, uh, talks on microservices of just moving code, moving it faster, and getting it out there even faster. Um, and so that's really where Docker comes in um, into a lot of this. So for the managers out there, uh, this isn't a stab at you or anything, but uh, it's I've had some managers like this before, um, where it's you know just ship fast, ship fast, ship fast, um, and that's good. At the same time. As a former quality engineer, we don't want to forget about testing it. Um, but being being a tester, uh, you know, being able to get code faster, not being able to just throw, or not having to just throw stuff over the wall, um, definitely helps. So this these are some large companies that are pretty uh, in depth with using Docker today. Um, I would hope you would be able to recognize at least one of them. Um, but ING is a, a large bank um, who is implementing with Docker, and they're, they're deploying applications 1,500 times a week. Um, if you break that out on a you know, linear average, they're deploying 300 times a day um, across their enterprise. You know, breaks it down a little bit more. You'd probably think teams are deploying up to 10 times a day across a, a number of teams globally distributed. So that's quite a lot for a large enterprise in a very secure and a very um, highly regulated industry. So Guilt Group, um, I attended their presentation at AWS reInvent uh, early last month, um, and they showed a, uh, a, a site traffic uh, graph where all their sales 
go off at 1 p.m. I think either noon or 1 p.m. I can't remember. Um, but it was basically their traffic for the day from midnight started here, started creeping up, spiked all the way up here at 12. At 12:05, it was back down here, um, and then back out this way for the rest of the day. So it's something where, when they're shipping 100 times a day, they need to know that what they're shipping is right. If they need to get a fix in before that huge spike, when you have I would hazard to guess 90% of your traffic in the span of 60 minutes, you want to be confident in what you're delivering, you want to be confident in what you're moving. Um, and Docker and kind of the container technology and integration really helps them do that. Uh, and then finally, uh, BBC News. Um, some of the other sessions I attended, we're talking about CICD here. Um, this is something where they're able to, because of the packaging, because of the mobility of these Docker images, they're able to run their CICD job 60% faster. Uh, and as somebody who was using a variety of CI/CD tools um, and kind of watching stuff go in, but then never come out because it was, we're doing CI/CD, but it's on a huge multi-gigabyte monolith that really doesn't move anywhere, doesn't move fast. So um, keeping things smaller, keeping things portable really helps with being able to do some of that integration. Uh, and then finally, run. Um, for those of the people who are working with Docker here already, how many of you are using it in what you would term as production? Okay. Um, based on uh, the CEO, Ben Golub's observation, that's a lot lower than the rest of their ecosystem that they've identified. Um, at last week at DockerCon, he had, he had mentioned that over 40% of their users are using it in production, um, which is a pretty staggering uh, number since there's a lot, at least for the, the companies that I see or I interact with on a kind of a, a wide breadth of technologies, that's for something that literally has exploded over the last 18 months. Um, that's a pretty high adoption rate for something like that, especially some of the, you know, two slides ago, some of the companies we saw that are that big um, adopting a technology, you kind of know it's real uh, and know it's usable when they're, they're kind of going into that. So, uh, what does this mean? Where are we going next? Um, Docker is generally just going to be the first step in how we start building faster applications. There was a, a couple of good microservices pitch here, um, and you know that's really where a lot of this is going. Um, we started with VMs. A lot of uh, public cloud kind of started on the ability to tear up and tear down virtual machines. Um, containers are the next evolution of that. It's still very early on, still very, uh, there's still a good bit of things to, to figure out as far as how do you connect things, how do you manage them at scale, like I mentioned earlier, how do you kind of bring all these pieces together. But that's really what Docker's worrying about, it's what the community is worrying about. Uh, we'll touch on some of the other pieces that you can use to manage some of this stuff in a second. Um, but you know, th these are the things that uh, ING, Gilt, BBC, they're figuring out, they're working with it, they're experimenting. Um, and so the, the Docker ecosystem, the Docker company as well, I mean, they're investing here to kind of see how, how far this can go, how much they can work with, how much they can integrate with all these other pieces, and then you know, even further expand it, revolutionizing Microsoft um, and how they would engage with some users, making it much more portable to use Windows, to use Windows servers uh, in, in the long run as well. So, like I said, these are some rather large names of companies that are using these in production today. Um, Google is using containers every time you perform a uh, every time you perform a query. Some of that is done inside of a container. Some of that information. So, you know, the number of searches that you run, um, and they come back with sub second, you know, sub times sub millisecond response times some of that uh, compute logic is being run inside of a container. Um, thinking of how portable that, that is, how, inf like how dense that information can be, but yet how quickly and easily and distributed they can make that is, is pretty impressive. Um, I mean, starting down here at the bottom, you've got a lot of pieces where it's still not very valuable. It's so what, they're just more tools. Um, I can give you a hammer and tell how awesome a hammer it is, but it doesn't really help if all you're doing is smashing eggs. I need to give you a couple of nails and some pieces of wood before you can you know, figure out how to, to make use of it. And that's really, once you get into some of this other space up here, that's where a lot more of it comes into play where you know, for eBay guilt, it's high scale uh, retail. 
where I would have to imagine that a good number of these applications were getting hit hard yesterday in the US for, or even in worldwide for the Black Friday sales, um, where you need things to be able to scale incredibly fast, incredibly easy. Um, and I would actually be looking forward to see some of the numbers if we end up getting reports on some of that information as far as the, not, not the dollar impact of Black Friday, but um, as an IT nerd, the, the impact of that on servers, on uh, kind of network traffic, things like that. Spotify is a huge company uh, in terms of revolutionizing how you're doing uh, peer deployment uh, or peer development, uh, as well as you know squad-based delivery. Um, anybody here doing squad-based development? Okay, the the teams that I'm closely associated with were were doing uh, squad-based development as well. Uh, you have a lot of life sciences that are getting into it, where before. Um, you had a lot of, you could donate your time to use uh, your spare computer, uh, essentially idle time for some of the, the research projects. With Docker, that's even easier to do that now where they can push out things into, uh, push basically a Docker image just for it to share um, some more compute time, just universally distributed, um, and makes it much easier to do rather than a lot of the, the hiccups and, and hills that they had before. Uh, and then, again, we mentioned ING already for finance, uh, and then Yelp, we'll talk about them again in a second as well, um, but they're doing some really cool things with essentially halfway in between IaaS and PaaS, um, kind of developing your own thing, which is a, a collection of um, microservice-oriented uh, components, similar to what you guys talked about yesterday, um, and kind of what they're delivering. So uh, there's really this notion coming up in the middle of IaaS and PaaS of how do I start and kind of am, am I able to move on top of, of IaaS um, and able to have <coughs> container management, data management, service discovery, logging and monitoring and all these other pieces that kind of make it uh, a requirement to be able to, to kind of uh, move at scale and again manage these at scale. So what's next? Um, I'll let you read that and actually understand how you're supposed to read it, I guess. Um, but this is really where we're kind of getting to. Um, what I mentioned to managing applications, managing them at scale, if, if Google's firing up a container you know, per, every, um, per every query that you put into the search bar, that's a lot of containers that they're managing over the course of the day. It may not be that many at any given time, or depending on the amount of people in the world who are using Google, there's probably a good number of them that are active at any given time. Um, but it's something where, again, you're going to have to manage this, this stuff at scale. It's going to become um, inception-based. You're going to be running things inside of other things. You're going to be worrying about how to manage these across multiple clouds, across multiple domains, whether it's in the public, whether it's in the public cloud, whether it's in a private on-premise cloud, whether it's in a dedicated public cloud. Um, I mean, just because now we're, we're building things with confidence, we're shipping it, and we're running things with confidence, Anything with success is just going to grow bigger. Anything with success is just going to be more uh, adopted, and that's really where we're getting to. So this is a, uh, a architecture um, similar to some of the other ones that you'll see on Stackshare. Um, how many people recognize icons that are on this slide? I, I would hope the majority of the room would recognize at least one. Um, and so, I mean, this is really how applications are being built today. Um, sim or, you know, contrary to the way monolith apps were built for the past, let's give these apps a good five years. So for the, you know, the first decade uh, of this millennium, uh, they were kind of all stacked together, built together uh, to adopt anything. It had to be, you know, you had to rip something out completely and replace it. But now you can start adopting and building applications that have interactions like this. Um, and this is moving us back towards that matrix of pain. Um, it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, I mean, Slack has a ridiculous amount of pre-built uh, integrations. Chef has an awesome community that has tons of cookbooks and recipes to interact with everything. Um, but I mean, these are all things that, you know, you want to make sure that you have an Elk stack for your logging and monitoring, but that requires you to set up Elasticsearch, Logstack, and Kibana. Um, you want to make sure things are up and running. You don't want to push it and then forget about it and then never know what's, what's running again. Um, and then, I mean, all of this is really runtime independent. This could be a VM, this could be a bare metal server, this could be a container. Um, it could really be pretty much anything across the board. 
Uh, so for anybody who's interested in more architectures and building some more things like this, you can go to stackshare.io. Um, you can search for apps and architectures based on uh, certain components um, or by companies. Um, I believe Reddit's stack is out there. The, sl the stack that actually runs Slack is out there. So it's, it's a good site if you are a, a good kind of uh, technology and component nerd. But this is really what we're moving to and to be able to, to manage all these components, to be able to start using all of these things at scale. When you're scaling things out, you wanna make sure um, that you're able to kind of control things in time, understand what's going on, alert people, bring them in, resolve it, and then have a continuous pipeline all the way through. Um, it really starts to be something where it can get, become quite painful again, but just because we moved away from the, the matrix of pain, we don't want to start adopting things super fast just because we're able to move super fast. Do a quick time check. All right. Um, so again, how many people have worked with or understand or heard of microservices? There have been a couple of good talks good, so that's what it's, it's better than I expected, so that, that's not too bad. Um, there was a, a, a chart yesterday in, in one of the talks that had a, uh, a little bit more adventurous take on monoliths versus uh, uh, microservices, but this is, uh, we've used this a couple times here where, again, when you scale a monolith, you need to copy all of your stuff. Um, and then when you're working with, you know, enterprise level Java web applications, that's something where now you need a whole new JVM and a whole new thread dedicated with a couple gigabytes of RAM. And you know, there's just, you get a new web container, you get a new JE or a new EJB container, uh, new messaging buses, all that stuff. And so scaling all that stuff just does not become tenable when you need to handle all that many instances. Um, now instead, instead of if you only need one more of this service, you don't need the whole thing moving to microservices when it deems necessary or when it's, you know, makes sense, uh, you can scale things out individually. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a microservice per se, but start thinking of a more service, externally oriented, service oriented uh, architecture. You can start breaking some of these pieces out, use them in a much you know, easier fashion, much grander fashion. And that's really where it starts to come back to the previous look and feel of that application, where now when you start scaling things out independently, when you have your application as you know, this replacing the runtimes, all of these pieces interacting separately and reporting into all of those pieces that were, were on the chart, you can think there were 13 or 14 logos on that previous chart. Now, if you've got a, an app that has five services inside of it, you've got at minimal five times 13 more interactions that you're, you're really looking at, how to make sure things are logging, how to make sure things are getting through the system. Um, so it, it, it tends to be something where this can grow quickly out of scale, out of hand, and you wanna be sure kind of what you're doing. So to handle some of the uh, container at scale pieces. Um, now, a lot of what, what's out there, and I, I should have probably even put uh, Swarm on here since it's Docker's container manager. Um, but these are, are things that you wanna start using to start running your containers at scale. Now you're not worried about just doing a Docker run and seeing that you have a database running locally, but you can easily manage 1,000, 10,000 container instances um, through a single console across infrastructure you know is there um, and you can distribute across, you can schedule it, you can use affinity, anti-affinity, things like that. Um, so this is re really some of the next steps. Um, and based on the amount of people that are experienced that kind of said in here, um, you may already know a lot of these links or even the links all come up over here, uh, but I will post these slides and I think the conference will post them too and these links will be in there. Uh, so you can either Google it or kind of go through these links here. But then the next step, um, and it's similar to some of the, the talks that I've seen here, is really microservice frameworks. Um, so these are things where now containers are just a one step in the evolution of how do I start managing these, th these things easily? How do I start managing these, th these things at scale? Um, uh, I believe it was right before DockerCon, the Yelp team put out uh, a good post on their platform, which they call Pasta, um, which I'm a fan of, of puns, so that's a good one. Um, but uh, the, the link here is to the, the GitHub repo and the link here is to the article that covers it. Um, and that's really something where they're using Docker as a core component, but they're also using you know, another open source project for service discovery, another open service source project uh, for logging and monitoring. Kind of they keep going down the list of how they built this up themselves and how they made it portable across infrastructure. Um, 
how they made it so you can manage all these components, how you can take it into account all the needs for what you're generally doing with you know, a traditional IT service management software, but doing it faster, doing it at scale, doing it easily with microservices. Um, Mantle is another one where it's very similar, where it's a collection of smaller service components. It's not something that forces you onto a given platform. It doesn't force you into AWS. It doesn't force you into software, uh, Google, Azure, or something like that. But it's something um, where these things are portable, where they're, they're meant to be movable, um, and you can kind of move all these pieces uh, as you want. Um, Weave is something similar. Um, I saw one presentation yesterday that was running Registrator. Anybody else here playing with Registrator or any of the other Weave components? Um, so that, that's something that's pretty cool where now um, when you're using Docker in a certain way, whenever you spin up uh, a container, it'll automatically post that container to a service discovery engine so that now the rest of your services know um, where, uh, where that service is. It can query, it can kind of get uh, a, an index of all the services based on that container getting spun up. Then when it goes away, it'll remove it from the index and you don't have to worry about cleaning it up. So this is really about having a bunch of interconnected services that are able to take care of containers that are able to move faster um, just based on kind of the fact that they're pre-integrated. Um, and I did say I work for IBM, so we have some of those pieces too. Uh, and the, the next chart is, is the one, actually two charts is the one that we'll, we'll jump into some of that. Um, but I mean, I'd really say if you're interested in, in containers, Check out, there's some getting started material at the end. Um, you know, if you're starting to use them already or you're, you're familiar with Docker locally, start checking out some of these, uh, even Swarm, uh, which I'll add before I submit, um, to kind of start checking some of this out, to kind of see how these are growing, how you can start managing them at scale. And then so you're not just managing containers one by one, but you're managing them, you know, in pods of five, 10, 100, 1,000, something like that. So how can you get started? Um, as all good use cases are, uh, they're small successes. Um, it means where it's just a matter of getting going. Um, this isn't something where you should try to burn the house down and you know start from scratch with, with Docker, uh, get it going, um, and replace everything. Uh, you definitely don't want to quote unquote Dockerize everything. Um, it's just uh, until you have some of the understanding like the Yelp team did for their own platform as a service, you're not really going to understand what that all means. Um, so do it piece by piece. Uh, generally, it's better to do it in greenfield applications. Um, based on the room being 50-50, uh, there's a lot of startup size projects that you'll be able to start that way. Um, newer teams ad adopting projects and frameworks inside of enterprises can do it. Um, it's not as good to do it retroactively just because there can be more friction. Um, but if you have people that believe in kind of adopting it for your given use case, it, it will work there too. And kind of, like I said, finally, understand the technology. Make sure that when you're working with it, it's something that you're not just trying to, you know, dockerize any, everything. Just make sure um, that you're using it in the right areas for the right reasons to, to kind of gain the speed that you need. Uh, remove some of those boundaries or some of the the points on that matrix of pain that you're used to. Um, if you see, uh, you know, code being stalled or delivery being stalled by not being able to move things through a pipeline because you're accommodating for too many edge cases, taking care of too many, um, you know, too many different uh, pr or parameters inside of each, you know, dev, test, staging, prod environment. This is something that, that might be for you. And then finally, just make a choice. Uh, I mean, the, the beauty of everything as a service now is something where you can try it out, you can play with it. If it doesn't work for you, move on. Um, you don't have to you know, have a huge amount of, um, of investment to be able to, to validate something. The majority of this stuff, Docker, similar to Chef, similar to Salt, a lot of it's open source. You can play with the engines. You can play with all of the stuff that you're talking with um, just on your laptop, figure it out, and then kind of move forward. Um, once you do kind of understand it and you want to go to uh, the next step where you don't want to be managing the infrastructure behind some of this, you don't want to be managing um, all of your virtual machines, all of your individual components by themselves, you can move to something that is a hosted service. Um, and then with that, we'll go to something that is a hosted service. Um, it, it's something where moving to a hosted container-based runtime, you have the ability now to forget about the VMs, forget about a lot of the underpinnings that you normally do. Um, 
depending on your enterprise structure, um, you may or may not have a lot of integration with CMDBs. You may, may or may not have a lot of integration uh, with existing ITSM products. Um, but this is something where you can spin up and kind of really harvest a lot of raw compute power without necessarily needing um, a lot of investment. Um, so with IBM containers, you get a public registry with a lot of uh, IBM enterprise software. Um, you get a private Docker registry uh, that you can push all your containers to, similar to um, the public Docker Hub registry and then the private uh, registry that, that you have through um, some of the Docker components as well. Uh, you have the ability to really integrate with 150 services. How many people stopped by the IBM booth here this week? Oh, well, that's a shame. Okay, there's one of you. Um, uh, but you have the ability to, to integrate with 150 services directly in the container. Um, who here has heard of a 12 app or 12 factor app? Okay, that's better. And on a positive note. Um, so, I mean, so that's something where you have the ability now to dynamically inject um, credentials from 150, over 150 Bluemix services. So, cognitive services, DevOps services, mobile services, data services. You can inject those in a 12 factor esque way into your containers uh, and really have those available. You have a hosted deployment pipeline, um, which is a hosted Jenkins environment. So, going back about four or five slides with all of the, uh, the icon throw up um, with uh, the Jenkins chart up at the beginning. You don't have to host your own Jenkins. You don't have to build your own Jenkins master slaves, et cetera. Uh, we've got one to do that for you. Um, you can do that with container deployments and groups. Uh, and then also, like I said, for me, one of the, the two most important things are at the end here. You got pre-integrated monitoring. Um, since I tend to do a lot of uh, hacking stuff and move fast, it doesn't always work right the first time. So it's important for me to, to spit out my logs into the, a pre-integrated ELK stack um, that you, again, don't have to manage, but gives you the full ability of, of uh, searching and graphing. And then finally, Vulnerability Advisor. Uh, we've had this out since over the summer. Uh, it's very similar to what Docker announced last week with their Nautilus. Um, the idea that images and containers are built on top of each other, you can source other containers and bring things in. Um, I don't know how many enterprise developers here have uh, the notion of saying, or their company tells them, you will not go down and download something and just run it. Obviously, it's good security practice to not do that anyway. Um, but when you do a Docker pool, that's essentially what you're doing, is just going out and getting somebody's software and running it and seeing what happens. Um, so Vulnerability Advisor will let you know, give you insight what's in there. As soon as you push it into the registry, it'll, it'll detail what's in there show you whether or not you've got vulnerabilities, you can set up policies, whether or not you can prevent some of those deployments. So um, this is just one option. Again, if you want to check it out, you can get started with a free trial at Bluemix. Um, but by all means, that is not the, the only way to get started here. Um, so you can get started with Docker itself. Um, there's a good, a good cheat sheet here that, that keeps growing uh, in GitHub that has a, a lot of community access. So if you're um, stuck, if you have questions, uh, you know, the, the Docker docs up there are the good ones to get running locally. Um, we ran some labs upstairs today at, at uh, just after noon. Um, these will be up there as well. You can run those afterwards as well, um, either locally or in, inside containers if you go ahead and sign up for Bluemix. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Question. Yep, so the, the benefit is, like I said, the majority of speed and scale. Um, so now the, the question was, what are the general benefits or what are containers for? Um, so you have the ability to package up your application, package up your code, and I can give you the container and you can run it in a Docker engine and it's gonna function the exact same way as it did for you as it did for me. You don't have to rebuild it, you don't have to take dependencies, you don't have to figure out any of this other stuff, but it's all right there, it's all pretty much a uniform kind of interaction method. Um, and so that once you start going to scales of thousands, once you start going to scales of hundreds of thousands, then you're able to quickly, easily distribute, integrate, and kind of move a lot of uh, code around. But containers aren't like VMs that pack up all the operating systems inside of everything, no? No, like, containers are lighter weight. There's, you have, 
the notion of containers as lightweight VMs, and I've also heard them been referred to as super processes. So it, it's something where you, you want to manage one thing inside of a container. So whether that's your web application or your Mongo database, you want to do one thing inside of a container and then have that run on top of a container host or in this source, um, a Docker engine. So it's something where you, you generally, you're not shipping around all of the binaries, you're not shipping around the Linux kernel. The engine runs on top of the Linux kernel, and then you have all your containers that run inside the engine. So it's something where you're just packaging just what you need. Um, the notion of just-in-time compiling for Java about you know, 10, 15 years ago, this is you know, just enough operating system to be able to package your stuff up and move it around. Good questions. Any other questions? That, the question was, how do you break up a, 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 micro, or a monolith into a microservice? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, it would very easily be its own talk. Um, I have a quick answer, and then I have a longer answer that is, that is a shameless plug. Um, generally, it's three steps. You want to look at, you know, start repackaging your app. Like I said, it kind of lends itself well to the build, ship, run method. But you want to repackage it, make sure that whatever you're wrapping it in, you're not you're doing it in an automatable fashion so that your package can be integrated in a CI CD framework. The next step is refactoring it, um, looking at what services you have inside, how those pieces are interacting, what dependencies they have. That's generally going to be a lot of work. The most work is going to be the last step, which is going to be refactoring your data. Um, and so there's a lot more now where going from the traditional monolith where everything is, is inside a single schema, the DBAs have control over everything. Now you're moving to something where um, you have uh, the capability to have every team have their own data model, every team have their own data backend. Um, so you need to refactor that. Is it something where you're just using a couple tables or a couple um, columns in, in this one table that you can probably break that onto a NoSQL database and not have an impact? Um, but that's, again, the whole, that topic is a whole session, and then just refactoring your data is a whole other session. Um, if you want a longer 15-minute talk on that, um, we just posted a video on YouTube. We just kicked off a video series called Microservices TV. Um, if you Google that, the last uh, um, topic on there with uh, myself and Kyle Brown, uh, who's one of our DEs that actually is doing just that with customers. They're going out and building uh, microservice-based applications from enterprise monoliths, and he, does, he talks exactly what you just asked. Yep. Any other questions? I think we're out of time, but we can push it. Okay, awesome. Thanks, guys.